All right, welcome everyone. Please continue to introduce yourself in the chat box. We have a lot to share with you today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Sarah Volker, and I'm the Associate Project Director for the PMCQI Technical Assistance Center. Um, and we're so happy that you all could join us today. There are just a few things to keep in mind as you're participating in the webinar. Everyone is joining with your lines open so that you can ask questions and engage in dialogue. Uh, that being said, we do ask that you put yourself on mute and only unmute when you're speaking. Um, you can also pose questions or comments through the chat box. Um, and if you do want to ask a question um, in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, there's a little raise your hand button. And um, raise your hand and we'll call on you and then you can unmute. Um, if you're having any technical issues, there is a tech support box at the bottom of the screen where you can type in for help. A reminder that we are recording this webinar and you can find handouts, including the slides from today, in the file share box. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce Kyle Poplinski, the Senior Data, Data Analyst with HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau, Division of Home Visiting and Early Childhood Services. Um, we're very excited to have him share some opening remarks today. Kyle? Great, Sarah. Thanks so much. And thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. Um, on improving data quality and reducing missing data. First of all, I just want to acknowledge that data quality, and in particular missing data, in relation to McVie's benchmark performance measures, um, is a really tough issue, and it has multi-layered antecedents, causes, and solutions. Um, but I do want to mention that um, we've seen marked improvement in data quality through the first couple of years of McVie's performance reporting on the new benchmark measures that were introduced in 2016. Um, so we think we're making great improvement here um, and are excited to offer the opportunity to share some more strategies and ideas about improving data quality and reducing missing data on today's webinar. I also just want to mention that we continue, HRSA continues to think through additional ways that we can help you all um, in supporting high-quality performance data both for performance reporting, but more importantly, for uses in your own programs to think through um, program performance, continuous quality improvement, um, and communicating about your own program. Um, just one example of that is the inclusion of a missing data field on Form 2, starting with um, next year's um, annual performance reporting. Um, and sort of another key strategy um, in those supports is this webinar today. So again, thank you all for joining us today. We hope this um, is useful information. And I also want to thank the team at EDC um, uh, on the PMCQI TA contract um, for putting this content together. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Thanks so much, Kyle. Also joining us today, um, are our presenters. So we have Mallory, who is the TA Specialist for Region 8, Rachel, TA Specialist for Regions 4, 6, and 10, and Susan, TA Specialist for oh, Region yeah. 2. And we're, we're excited to hear from all of them today. Um, our objectives for today are to describe the characteristics of quality data, review guidance for identifying missing data, share strategies that you can use to address data quality and missing data, and highlight some available TA resources to support you in this area. So again, we encourage you to use the chat box to engage with each other and post questions as they come to mind, and we'll be pausing at a few spots to open up the lines and hear from as many of you as possible. So with that, I will turn things over to Mallory. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Mallory Clark, and I am the TA Specialist for Region 8. And we're going to spend a little bit of time during the first part of our webinar this afternoon discussing data quality. Quality data consistently and accurately indicate what's happening in your home visiting program. High quality data gives you confidence in your findings and the impact of your program. 
Quality data are complete, which means all values are present. They're accessible, which means they're available when required or needed. They're relevant or answer the proposed question. They're accurate or free from errors and reliable or consistent. It's important to use data to help identify CQI topics. However, before reviewing and interpreting those data, it's important to ensure you are using quality data. Module two of the CQI toolkit release, released last year includes more details on quality data and has a handout to support you on using data to drive CQI and identify topics. A link to the module can be found in the file share pod. So we'd like to just take a second and in the poll, please let us know if you, um, if the data challenges you encounter are typically related to completeness, accessibility, relevance, accuracy, or reliability of data. What do you think, completeness? Yeah. All right, I'll give you just a few more seconds to finish up. It looks like for now, we have an overwhelming majority of people say completeness is the most uh, common error that you encounter, or the most uh, common challenge that you encounter with your data quality. Um, so if anybody wants to expand on that a little bit more and tell me a little bit more about those challenges, feel free to unmute your line and um, share a little bit more. Um, it sounds like nobody wants to share, um, but thank you so much for completing the poll. And I hope that uh, through the rest of um, this webinar, through the information that I provide and that uh, Rachel provides, we'll be able to help you um, better the completeness of your data. So to have quality data, good data collection techniques are necessary. Adopting the following four steps can help ensure collection of high quality data that will inform your work. The first step is standardization. Follow a consistent and standardized approach to collecting and inputting the data. This can be achieved by developing manuals or policies to document the process for collecting and inputting data. Second step is appropriate tool selection. Choose tools, screenings, and assessments that are valid and reliable for the families being served. For example, the ASQ questionnaire is considered a valid and reliable tool to screen for delays in child development for particular ages. Within the ASQ protocol, there are specific timeframes that are considered reliable. For example, it's appropriate to use the nine-month ASQ from ages nine months and zero days to nine months and 30 days, but not 25 months, for example. The next step is staff training. Ensure that all staff have initial and ongoing training and support to use in the standardized tools and data collection processes. For example, in the case of collecting data on attendance at the six-week postpartum visit, home visitors should be trained to know what occurs at the medical visit to identify the differences between a well-woman visit and the six-week postpartum visit. The final step are data management processes. Ensure that data are stored and maintained <clears throat> in an appropriate manner so they can be reviewed and reported as needed. If data aren't reported, reports won't reflect that. So we really want to make sure that your work is counted. Through our experience providing TA, we've identified several strategies awardees have used to identify data quality issues. Typically, these can be categorized into two categories, measurement-based or programmatic-based strategies. Awardees have used the following measurement-based strategies to address data quality. Many awardees support LIAs in identifying and correcting data quality issues through specific reports. This can include running benchmark reports at the LIA level to help LIAs identify missing data and data quality issues. This should be done on a regular basis, but the frequency really depends on you as the awardee and the LIA's capacity. 
It can be done twice a year, quarterly, monthly, or any other time frame that you see fit. Other awardees utilize model developers' canned or built-in data quality reports that are in their data system to identify data quality issues. Awardees have also developed missing data reports specifically for Form 1 and Form 2. Awardees run these on a regular basis and discuss results with LIAs. And again, this can be done as frequently as you see fit. Awardees have also developed new and improved data systems. Um, so either developing a new data system or improving their current data system to include data quality checks, which may be flags or reminders, uh, required fields or logic to help in entering accurate data. For example, a data system might validate an ASQ score within an appropriate range, or a data system can actually flag or remind the home visitor when it's time to administer the ASQ. And finally, many awardees dedicate staff time to addressing data quality and missing data issues in real time. Programmatic-based strategies include developing policies, procedures, and protocols around administering and collecting data on specific performance measures or screening tools. For example, awardees may develop written protocols on when to administer the ASQ that align with tool guidance and the NICSI performance measure guidance. Um, capacity building can take on many forms. Um, this can include targeting support to LIAs with specific data quality challenges. It may also include training on specific performance measures, like training home visitors on cultural sensitivity for questions related to breastfeeding and bed sharing, or providing information on community resources available for IPV referrals. Supporting home visitors in understanding the importance of data and how to use it for program improvement or to tell the story of, the home, of home visiting's impact on families is also an important part of capacity building. And finally, CQI projects can help awardees and LIAs systematically address data quality issues. CQI allows teams to work together to identify and test strategies that work to address data quality challenges. A CQI project to address data quality may include testing different strategies in the way home visitors ask families questions on specific performance measures to determine which works best for the family and for the home visitor. So we'd like to take a few minutes to reflect on um, the, what we've just talked about around data quality and the strategies there. So in the chat box, if you could please answer the following questions. What experiences have you had using these strategies to address data quality challenges? How do you plan on using one or more of these strategies to address data quality challenges? Or what other strategies have you used to address those challenges? So if you would like to type them in the chat box, we recommend that. Um, you can also unmute your lines and share the strategies out loud. I'm sorry, did somebody want to share? So Jeremy mentioned that um, they've made quarterly review of Form 1 and Form 2 reporting more formal and using a video conference to make it more interactive. That's a great idea. Looks like a few more people are still entering in some responses, so I'm just gonna wait a little bit longer. And Tracy, did you want to share over the phone line? We saw you had your hand raised. Okay. 
okay, while we're waiting for Tracy, I'm just going to go through some of the other things that I've brought up. Um, Andrea has used the CQI project related to referral documentation and transfers um, and developing a new data system with business rules. I think that's a great idea. Katie mentioned that they use uh, data check files from the data system to check for missing and inaccurate data. Sounds like that's um, in some of your programs, but not all of them yet. Um, Mac mentioned using monthly CQI meetings with NLIA. It's great. Um, specifically, in looking at um, specific performance measures. It's a great idea. Reminders for when things are due, missing reports, um, right before the reporting period ends. Quarterly data reports and review of outcomes with each LIA and a performance measure workshop annually. That's a great idea to get everybody together and discuss challenges, successes, and strategies. Quarterly benchmark reviews. Presenting numbers by LIA, that's a great idea in-person review of missing data and data quality issues. Great. It sounds like these are really great ideas. Um, just for the purposes of time, um, if nobody wants to share out loud, um, Rachel, I think I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Mallory. And feel free to keep entering in great ideas that you guys have in the chat box. Please do that. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Glisson, and I'm the TA specialist working with Regions 4, 6, and 10. And since we've heard a bit about quality data, next we're going to cover some specific issues regarding missing data. So first, we're going to talk about what is missing data. Next, we'll discuss common reasons awardees have missing data and how to handle it in reporting. We have a few examples from Form 1, but we will mostly be focused on Form 2. And you'll have many opportunities to test your knowledge throughout this section of the webinar with poll questions, so get ready. And lastly, we'll leave you with some strategies you can use to address missing data throughout the year. All right. So what do we mean by missing data? Missing data is an extremely important topic when talking about quality data these two really go hand in hand. When values are missing that are needed for measurement calculations, awardees are only able to show a partial or incomplete picture of the work they're doing on the ground. It affects accuracy and completeness of data in reporting. For Form 1, data are considered missing if one or more data elements needed are unknown. The example given is if information was not collected for a child's insurance status. The value is unknown and should be reported as missing data for Table 18. In Form 2, data are considered missing if one or more data elements needed to determine inclusion in the numerator or denominator are unknown. And we're going to cover several examples over the next few slides. So each performance measure has a specific missing has specific missing data guidance, and you can find it in the Form Tool Form 2 toolkit and the guidance on identifying missing data documents in the file share pod. It's important to understand the reasons for missing data because the strategies for addressing it could be different. Some common reasons for missing data are the data collection schedule doesn't exactly match up to the performance measurements. For example, in safe sleep, any child one year or younger without safe sleep information should be, should be reported as missing data. This would include children who did not have sleep, safe sleep information because they did not reach their first data collection of, say, two months old. They should be reported as missing data. Also, missed visits. When families miss visits, especially around data collection time points, it's very possible that the result will be missing data. So, for example, if you're working to re-engage a family around six months, you might miss the breastfeeding status. You might not have that information to report due to families missing visits. Another reason could be need for additional staff support. So much of data reporting relies on staff feeling confident and comfortable with screening tools, data collection schedules, data systems, and entry. 
all of, the pe all of these pieces can be challenging, so when that staff support isn't available, missing data could occur. And the last one, respondent refusal or non-response. Sometimes participants decline to answer a question or participate in a screening. It's part of data collection and happens, but could result in missing data. All right. So now that we know what we mean by missing data and some common reasons that missing data occur, how do we handle it in reporting? HRSA states that awardees should include the number of missing data, even if it's under 10%. In Form 1, it is included in the tables. In Form 2, it should be included in the comments section. And if missing data exceeds 10% for Form 1 or Form 2, awardees should describe reasons for missing data and possibly include plans to reduce missing data over the next reporting period. You have some great tools available to help you understand missing data, so please always reference the guidance on identifying missing data and the Form 1, Form 2 toolkits. Also, please reach out with any questions to your TA specialist. So now we're going to jump in with some examples. Let's take a look at household income from Form 1. Household income refers to the annual gross income for the household, and it's recorded at enrollment and annually thereafter. To determine household income in relation to the federal poverty guidelines, the awardee will need to know the household income and the number of household members reported in the household, both home visiting enrollees and non-enrollees. If either the household income or the total number of household members is not recorded, then the household should be recorded as unknown or did not report. And that's in that second to last row in Table 14. So let's jump to some Form 2 examples, starting with postpartum care. To refresh your memory, this measure looks at the percent of the mothers enrolled in home visiting prenatally or within 30 days after delivery who received a postpartum visit with a health care provider within eight weeks, 56 days of delivery. The logic statements from the Form 2 toolkit walk you through the different scenarios of data collection and reporting. The statements give you next steps and are there to help narrow down the numerator and denominator for each measure. In the postpartum care logic statements, we start with, for each mother enrolled in your program at any point during the reporting period, was she enrolled prenatally or within 30 days after delivery? Yes, continue on. No, she's not included in the measure. Or information missing. Let's get really concrete and talk through an example. So in our program, we had 80 mothers enrolled at any point during the reporting period that were enrolled prenatally or within 30 days after delivery. So that's coming from this first logic statement. Out of the 80 mothers that we identified for step one, 60 of those reached eight weeks post-delivery within the reporting period. The second logic question helps us identify those 60 mothers. The final question is if a mother completed a postpartum visit on or before eight weeks, 56 days after delivery. In our example, 40 mothers completed the visit within eight weeks of delivery, 10 completed it but after eight weeks, and 10 mothers did not have any information recorded about a postpartum care visit. Now that we've talked to the beginning of one example, let's test our knowledge about how to handle certain cases with two poll questions. So I'm going to read both poll questions and then give you some time to answer them. Um, but the first one is, we have a mother who enrolled prenatally but did not reach eight weeks postpartum in the reporting period. Do we include her in the denominator, report her as missing, exclude her from the measure, or I don't know? And the second question, is a mother enrolled prenatally, reached eight weeks postpartum in the reporting period, but has no information about if she completed her postpartum doctor's visit recorded? Do you include her in the denominator, report her as missing, exclude from the measure, or I don't know. 
All right, I'll give you about 10 more seconds to answer both of these questions. Great, this is looking really good. So for our first poll question, you guys are correct. The answer is to exclude her from the measure. She didn't reach that eight weeks postpartum in the reporting period, so she's not going to be included in the measure. And for the second poll question, y'all are correct again, the answer is to report her as missing data. She has no information about if she completed that postpartum visit, but reached all of the other criteria, so we're gonna report her as missing. Great job. So we'll go ahead and finish up our example for postpartum care. So we had 60 mothers that reached the eight weeks post-delivery time point in the reporting period, but 10 of them did not have any information about a postpartum visit recorded. These 10 mothers should be excluded from the denominator and recorded as missing data. So our numerator would be 40, our denominator 50, and missing data is 10 or about 17%. So a note, including the reasons for missing data would be expected for this measure, for this example. Um, now I'm going to continue on because I have three other examples to get through, um, but please keep chatting any of your questions in the chat box and we will get you answers. All right, our next performance measure we're going to talk about is safe sleep. And to refresh our memory, this measure looks at the percent of infants enrolled in home visiting that are always placed to sleep on their backs without bed sharing or soft bedding. Now that we understand the definition of the measure, let's talk through the logic statements. In the safe sleep logic statement, we start with, for each index child enrolled in your program, was she or he exactly one year old or younger at any point in the reporting period? Yes, continue on. No, they're not included in the measure. Or information missing. For example, the example we're going to use, we have 300 children who are exactly one year or younger at any point in the reporting period. Of those 300 children who were exactly one year or younger at any point in the reporting period, 100 primary caregivers reported that they were always placed to sleep on his or her back and without bed sharing or soft bedding. 100 primary caregivers reported no to at least one of the pieces of the question. 50 children didn't have any information recorded in the system about safe sleep. And I'm going to throw in an interesting twist. Our awardee data plan states that we don't start measuring safe sleep for children until two months of age. So 50 children didn't reach our first reporting time point of two months. Not everyone uses this data collection strategy. It's just for this example, so please don't worry if your time points aren't exactly the same. So what do we do with this example? Who's considered missing? Let's go to some poll questions to get your feedback. All right. So our first poll question, a child is one month of age and did not reach our first awardee set data collection time point of two months of age. This is according to the, our performance measurement plan. So they don't have any information on safe sleep recorded. Do we include them in the denominator, report them as missing data, exclude them from the measure, or I don't know? And our second question is a child is, at, is six months at the end of the reporting period and did not have complete information on safe sleep recorded. Do you include them in the denominator, report as missing data, exclude them from the measure, or I don't know? All right, take a couple more seconds to respond to the questions. See, we're still changing a little bit. All right, for both of these, the answer is to report as missing data. 
and here's why. So the measure states that anyone under one year old should be included in the, perform in the calculation. If we don't have information on anyone under two months old, they still don't have that information, so they should be reported as missing data. Even though our awardee performance measurement plan said we're not going to collect until two months, they still don't have that information being requested. So I'm going to highlight that setting your own data collection time points that work for your program is really important, but it might result in some missing data. So that balance is really key. We're not saying um, adding uh, data collection time points, but finding that balance for getting the information you need um, and not overburdening, overburdening home visiting staff is really important. All right. Let's go on to our next slide. We'll take down the poll questions and finish up this safe sleep data example. So we had 100 children out of 300 that were less than one year old during the reporting period that did not have any information about safe sleep. So keep in mind that any child one year or younger without safe sleep information should be reported as missing data. And this would include those children who did not have safe sleep information because they didn't reach our awardee set first data collection time point of two months old. So our missing data is 100 children, or about 33%, and a note including the reasons for missing data would be expected for this measure. All right, we've got two more examples. Our next one is about intimate partner violence screening, and the measure is looking at the percent of primary caregivers enrolled in home visiting who are screened for intimate partner violence within six months of enrollment using a validated tool. Let's go ahead and talk through the logic statements. In the IPV screening logic statement, we start with, for each primary caregiver enrolled in your program, did she or he reach six months post-enrollment during the reporting period? Yes, continue on. No, they're not included in the measure or information missing. This is really important and I'm going to highlight it. Primary caregivers need to reach six months post-enrollment during the reporting period to be included in the calculation. That means that there might have been a screening that occurred in the previous reporting period and the caregiver wouldn't have been included until the reporting period where they reached six months post-enrollment. That first piece is really important. Did they reach six months post-enrollment during the reporting period? So our numbers. We had 200 primary caregivers reaching six months post-enrollment during the reporting period. Out of those 200 caregivers, 150 were screened within six months, 30 were screened after six months, and 20 were not screened at all. So in this example, who is considered missing? Let's go ahead and bring up the poll questions. And there's three this time. So our first question, a primary caregiver did not reach six months post-enrollment during the reporting period. Do you include them in the denominator, report them as missing, exclude them from the measure, or I don't know? Our second question, a primary caregiver reaches six months post-enrollment. She was screened in the previous reporting period. What do we do? Include in the denominator, reporter is missing, exclude her from the measure, or I don't know. And our last one is about a primary caregiver reaches six months post-enrollment during the reporting period and was not screened. Do you include them in the denominator, report is missing, exclude them from the measure, or I don't know. It'd take about 10 more seconds. Okay. So the first one, great job, everybody agrees. Um, we exclude 
them from the measure. They did not reach six months post-enrollment during the reporting period, so we exclude them from the measure. For our second poll question, they reached, that primary caregiver reached six months post-enrollment, but she was screened in the previous reporting period. She should be included in the denominator. She is included in the measure where she reaches that six month post-enrollment, regardless of when she's screened. So most, most everyone got that one. And we seem to be pretty split about the last one. A primary caregiver reaches six months post-enrollment during the reporting period and was not screened. She should be, she or he should be included in the denominator. Just because they were not screened, that, that's not, um, they're still going to be included in that denominator since we're measuring screening for intimate partner violence. So let's go to this last slide and we'll talk through it a little bit more. All right. So for this example, we had 150 primary caregivers out of 200 that reached six months post-enrollment in the reporting period and were screened within that six-month time point. So the 150 primary caregivers were screened. And the screening measures have slightly different instructions for how to record missing data. So if the only thing missing is documentation of whether the screen occurred, the primary caregiver is going to be included in the denominator but not in the numerator if they reach that six-month post-enrollment during the reporting period. So there's no missing data to record for this measure. And just a note, awardees should still include a note in the performance measure stating that there's no missing data. It's just a good practice to have. All right. Our last example that's going to build off the intimate partner violence screening, we're going to talk about the intimate partner violence referral performance measure. And this measure is the percent of primary caregivers enrolled in home visiting with positive screens for intimate partner violence using a validated tool who receive information, referral information to IPV resources. So keep in mind for this performance measure, if there is no documentation of whether a referral was provided, but all other data elements are available and inclusion in the denominator can be determined, then the primary caregiver should be included in, in the denominator, but not the numerator. I know that was really wordy, so we're going to talk through an example of this. So, we had 15 primary caregivers that screened positive within the first six months of enrollment. Ten primary caregivers were referred to IPV resources. Three did not receive any referral to IPV resources, and two were referred, but it was not documented in the system. Remember, for this measure, primary caregivers who are eligible to be included in the denominator will be included in each annual report until the conditions in the numerator have been met. So there may be some caregivers included in the measure that screened positive last year and did not receive referral information at that time that would be included in this year's measure. Okay. And another piece of this. So any primary caregivers that are missing an IPV screening should be included as missing data for this measure. There was no screening completed, so we don't know if they would be a positive screen. So from our previous example around IPV screening, there were 20 primary caregivers that did not receive an IPV screen. And these 20 primary caregivers are included as missing data for the referral measure. So I know this is a lot of information. So let's go to the poll questions. Um, to gauge our knowledge about missing data for this example, and then we'll wrap up this section. Um, okay, so our first question, a primary caregiver screened positive in a prior reporting period, but they did not receive a referral during that reporting period. Do you include them in the denominator, report them as missing, exclude them from the measure, or I don't know? 
And the last one, a primary caregiver reaches six months post-enrollment during the reporting period and was not screened. Do you include them in the denominator, report them as missing, exclude them from the measure, or I don't know? So take a couple more seconds. Okay. So for this first one, a primary caregiver screened positive in a prior reporting period, but they didn't receive a referral during that reporting period. So they should be included in the denominator um, as long as they were still enrolled during our current reporting period. So we would include them in this year. And then our last poll question was a primary caregiver reaches six months post-enrollment during the reporting period and was not screened. And these people are going to be reported as missing data for this measure. And a majority of y'all got that. So good job. All right. So we, um, those primary caregivers that weren't screened, we don't know if they were, would have had a positive screening, so they would be missing data for this measure. So let's wrap this one up. For this example, we had 20 primary caregivers who are not screened, and they should be included as missing data since we don't know if they were positive screens. And the two primary caregivers that were missing documentation of their referral status should be included in the denominator. The only thing missing was the documentation, and the guidance states that those cases should be included in the denominator. So the missing data for this measure is 20 and possible reasons for why the data is missing should be given in the annual reporting submission. All right. So we have talked through four examples and a lot of information. And we now know how to report missing data in Form 2 for each of those four measures. But what can we do about missing data throughout the year? Listed on the slides are some strategies you can take to improve missing data. But to improve that missing data, you need to have, you have to know how much missing data you have and why the data are missing. Um, so some of the strategies to help address data quality can help you address missing data as well. So remember that first section that we talked about. It's important to have standardized processes in the field and in the office for data collection and entry. Running reports periodically can help you identify missing data throughout the year. Um, Training for home visitors, both initially and ongoing, um, is really, really helpful. Also, informed decisions about data collection time points. It's not to collect data more often. There's an important balance between reducing missing data and not overburdening home visiting staff. And lastly, that data system capability. Ways to document this information is really important. And when you rely on it just a checkbox that says, yes, a postpartum visit was completed, it's unclear if the checkmark is unclicked, if a mother did not complete the visit was a true no, um, or if this information was never asked or skipped. An ideal system would have the capability to, st to distinguish yes, no, or missing. And missing data can be a struggle in performance measure reporting, but if you implement different strategies to address it, it becomes more manageable. Waiting until the last minute to identify and address missing data leads to a lot of stress. So please use your resources that you have available, the guidance, the toolkits, TA specialists throughout the year to help alleviate missing data issues. And with that, I am going to throw it to Sarah, I think. Great, thank you, Rachel. Um, and we we have some time now to take some questions, so I know you've been chatting them in. Um, and if anyone would like to ask a question over the phone line, raise your hand and we'll be monitoring those. Um, we've had a few questions come in about how to calculate uh, percent of missing data for Form 2. Um, and so our recommendation for that would be to Take the, the number of missing divided by all the, the clients who had the potential to be included in the denominator. So it would be your missing divided by the sum of your reported denominator 
and you're missing. If you have more detailed questions about that, you can reach out to your TA specialist. They'd be happy to work through those with you. Um, I see we have a question for missing data. Do you want specific reasons why data are missing or just the total number of missing? And Rachel, I wonder if you would like to respond to that. Rachel, you might be muted. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> I always do that for some reason. Can you ask the question one more time, please, of which one you, were, you brought up? Sure. For reporting missing data, should awardees uh, include the specific reasons why data are missing or just the no total number of missing? I think it's good good practice. Definitely include the number, the total number of missing. Um, but if that number is over 10%, then include reasons of why the data was missing. And we see there have been a few questions about um, access to um, other awardees' uh, performance data or seeing a um, we're seeing an average. Uh, we will share those questions with the, the HRSA team, those suggestions with the HRSA team, and um, see. I know in, in the past, sometimes um, overall performance data has been shared back through presentations. Okay, and we have a question from Jessica for IPV, and I think this is the IPV referral measure. Would we need to report the number of caregivers missing screening data that are included in the denominator in the notes to HRSA? So Rachel, I'm going to throw that one to you again. Sure. So, so for the IPV, Anyone who wasn't screened during the reporting year would be included in the notes for IPV referrals as missing data. I'm pretty sure that's what you're asking, but if that's not exactly, just let me know. Okay, good. Okay, please continue to put your questions in the chat box and we'll respond when we can or follow up after the call if we need to. But in the interest of time, I want to turn things over to Susan now so she can share some information about a new TA opportunity. Thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Zayed and I work with the Region 2 awardees. Uh, HD PMCQI is excited to offer an optional TA opportunity to interested awardees. Your HD PMCQI TA specialist is available to support you with an interim review of performance data. These reviews will be tailored to meet your program's unique needs and driven by your own goals and questions. Regular data reviews are essential for monitoring and improvement work and can benefit multiple aspects of your program. In addition to addressing questions related to data quality and analysis, a review of your performance data can uncover opportunities for CQI, topics for LIA training and technical assistance, and areas for program improvement. If you're thinking about requesting an interim data review, how much time should you set aside? The time required will depend on your specific goals for the review. Awardees should plan for at least two 60-minute conference calls with TA specialists and HRSA project officer. In the first call, you'll work together to identify key questions to be explored during the review, reflect on any challenges with your most recent data submission, and decide what data will be shared and in what format. The second call will focus on discussing the written feedback provided by your TA specialist and some suggested next steps. In between calls, awardees will need to dedicate some time to gathering data and reviewing feedback. 
We recommend that awardees include multiple staff members and roles in these discussions to engage diverse perspectives on the data and benefit the full range of your work. So there are many benefits of requesting an interim data review of your performance measures, many of which are listed on the slide. Some awardees have taken advantage of this opportunity in previous years. And these reviews have helped them to identify and address challenges prior to the annual submission deadline. Look for preliminary test changes in the data systems or processes. Use data from, inter, uh, from interim reviews to provide feedback to LIAs. And improve the quality of their annual data submission, which will reduce the need for multiple revisions. More information on interim data reviews was provided to you all through the McBee listserv. So you can refer to that handout for more details. If you're interested in taking part in an interim data review, feel free to reach out to your PMCQIT specialist and HRSA project officer. We welcome any questions you have right now. And also, if there are any awardees on the line who've taken advantage of an interim review in the past and would like to share their experience, feel free to do so now. Okay, hey, thank you, Susan, and thank you, everyone, for your questions and comments. Um, as we said before, please feel free to reach out to your PMCQIPA specialists and project officers with any follow-up questions. Um, we've noted a few here that we didn't um, quite get to, um, and we will be following up with you to try and get more information so that we can answer your questions. Um, at this point, we'd like to ask you to take just a moment and reflect on any action steps you can take based on the information that you've heard today. So you'll see some poll questions have appeared at the bottom of your screen. Um, do you plan to take an action step based on this webinar, yes or no? If yes, please let us know what that action will be. And if no, we'd like to hear from you about what, it would, what would have been helpful to you in identifying a future action step. Hey, you can continue to uh, type in your responses. We're seeing some good action steps here, um, and it looks like um, some potential opportunities for some follow-up TA. Uh, we want to close by saying thank you again for joining us today, for sharing your time, questions, and feedback with us. We are always looking for ways to improve, and we want to use your input to help guide that improvement. So we would greatly appreciate it if you would take a few extra minutes of your time to complete a short survey um, and share your thoughts on today's webinar. There's a link at the bottom of your screen. And once we end the webinar, the survey will appear in your web browser. Um, just as a reminder, the slides 
from today's webinar um, are available in the file share box, and we will um, email those out with a thank you email um, for attending. Um, so thank you again, and please feel, feel free to reach out with any questions. Have a wonderful day.